confused about what is allowed, what, what kind of water you can discharge and what uh, you can't. So hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to make some clarity there. I'm gonna briefly talk about regulations. This is where I'm gonna get myself in trouble. So I wanna talk about very little, but hopefully it will be uh, helpful. And then I'm gonna spend most of the time about management practices. So these are the important, these are the important things. These the practices that you can implement in your operation to avoid that uh, the water that leaves your operation uh, will be uh, like in these pictures. So this is this is what this is all about. We are trying to avoid a scenario like this um, because. Well, because it's bad for the environment and also because it's going to get you in trouble with the regulatory agencies. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to uh, point you towards some of the resources that are, that are out there to help you implement these uh, practices. So what is runoff? Runoff is any water that flows on the ground in your operation, whether it comes from your irrigation system, whether it comes from rain, whether it comes from uh, maybe your uh, maybe your employees are washing some uh, uh, buckets uh, or maybe they're washing some machinery, any water that flows on the ground is runoff. And, uh, and the, the challenge is that water will flow towards, uh, well, by gravity, and it will end in a storm drain. And if that is outside of your property, that's considered discharge and that's regulated. So what causes runoff? Impervious surfaces. And uh, because of what we do with agriculture, um, often we tend to do things on the ground that uh, in many uh, ways uh, cause runoff. So in, 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 in many circumstances, it's difficult to completely eliminate it because we till the soil, because we remove um, the vegetation, because we remove weeds, because we build uh, um, greenhouses and hoop houses and uh, weed mats. So many of the uh, operations that we do as, uh, as in agriculture create imp impervious surfaces and these impervious surfaces um, prevent water, uh, rainwater from infiltrating into the ground. And so, uh, and so we get runoff. The problem is that um, uh, this water that is moving um, on the ground uh, causes erosion. And so it cuts, it, it picks up uh, soil particles, what is called sediment. And on its way um, to the storm drain, it can pick up other materials and other pollutants. So your um, responsibility is about everything that happens to this water from the moment that it rains on your property to the moment that leaves your property and goes inside, inside the storm drain. And you will see that many of the management practices will be about dealing uh, with this water in between these two uh, moments. Um, so erosion is caused, is in, increased by high slopes, uh, by the velocity of water, uh, by the soil type and by vegetation. Many of these you cannot change much, but vegetation is a big one. And you will hear me talking about vegetation a lot because vegetation increases uh, the infiltration of this water in the soil. It uses water because it's alive and so it transpires and uses this water. It uses the nutrients. So it picks up naturally, picks up nit uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. It uh, slows down um, the flow of water. It avoids erosion because the roots hold in place these soil uh, particles. And also vegetation provides a, a lot of surfaces for uh, pesticides to get attached to and for uh, sediment also to get attached to. So vegetation is kind of the solution to all evil. And I will be talking about that um, 
a lot. Uh, again, unvegetated surfaces are those that cause runoff, including roads. Roads are the largest problem that you will have with runoff and with erosion. Um, water and roads don't mix well. Um, roads are um, unvegetated because we drive on them. So uh, grass and vegetation cannot, cannot grow there. And also they are highly compacted because we drive on them. And so for these reasons, and, and they tend to concentrate uh, water and, and I, will, I, will, I will show later how the more concentrated flow of water, it was, it's what causes uh, problems with, uh, with erosion. Uh, so roads uh, will be one of the areas where you will spend probably 80% of your time uh, when you're dealing with erosion, uh, you will spend on roads. But the good news is that NRCS uh, that I will talk about later have, has a lot of uh, practices to help you uh, with erosion on roads. Um, runoff is, cre is uh, caused when the application rate is higher than infiltration rate. The application rate is how much water uh, you apply to your soil with a sprinkler system. And it's a constant. It's a number that it caused, it's it determined by the sprinklers you have, by how the big the nozzles are and the pressure, the spacing, etc. And you can have a person like myself uh, calculate it for you. The infiltration rate is a variable and depends on the soil. So when the infiltration rate, when the, the rate at which this water gets into the soil is faster than the velocity at, at which it penetrates into the soil, you start having ponding and you start having runoff. And, uh, and the infiltration rate is not constant. It decreases over time. So typically in these irrigation systems, you see the grower that starts irrigating and for the first hour, all the water is going into the soil. There is no problem, I'm fine. I'm gonna uh, do something else with my tractor on that other block and then two hours into the irrigation for the, for the whole third hour, you get a river of, of runoff um, that leaves your property and goes into the storm drain. Um, as I said earlier, it's challenging sometimes to uh, eliminate it completely. Uh, for example, in these pictures, in this picture, you have a highly tilled soil um, on a sloping ground. And so this is a situation that should uh, catch your attention uh, because if rains, if rains are coming soon, like in this season now, you don't want to find yourself in this situation because uh, uh, a highly tilled soil, when it's very fluffy and when it's very pulverized, um, I, I, I originally, um, intuitively, I was thinking that it would infiltrate a ton of water, right? It's so, it's so fluffy and dry. But it's actually the other way around. It's uh, it, the water doesn't penetrate. It it actually runs off on it. So this is a situation where you don't want to find yourself if the rains are coming. This other example is uh, caused by these hoop houses, and uh, the water was being concentrated by these uh, impervious surfaces, and uh, all this area got saturated with water and it caused the, uh, this stream bank failure. So again, every time you have impervious surfaces, every time you have uh, uh, highly tilled soils and uh, high slopes, that's a situation that is um, very um, susceptible to have erosion. Uh, again, erosion is water that flows in the soil and it cuts the soil and it picks up uh, soil particles. And uh, a lot of it has to do with how concentrated the flow is. So if you have uh, the least concentrated is a sheet flow. So imagine all this water that is uniformly flowing into uh, on the soil and it still causes erosion, but it's, it's the least, um, it's the least, um, uh, 
uh, it's, the, it's the kind of erosion that picks up the least quantity of, uh, of uh, soil particles. Then you have real erosion that is maybe a, 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 a channel that is less than an inch deep. And when it's deeper than one inch, you call it a gully and it's like this. And uh, sometimes you, can, you, can, you could build a house inside it because it's so deep. And imagine all the volume of soil that this, it's actually, it looks like a canyon, right? I mean, imagine all the soil that, uh, all the uh, sediment that this water picked up. And the factors that cause erosion are high slope um, that you can do little about, but except terracing, there are practices that allow you uh, to uh, reduce the, um, the, uh, the, your slope. Um, but vegetation, again, is a, is a big one. Um, it seems that this field was um, seeded, but probably the, uh, the vegetation didn't have enough time to get established. So if you're, if you're thinking about vegetating your surfaces, think ahead. Make sure that your vegetation will have time to establish itself. Um, Channels that have a, a small cross section that tends to uh, increase the velocity of water, and that the velocity of water uh, causes um, increases the ability of water to pick up this uh, sediment and to cut and to create erosion. And then organic matter uh, increasing your organic matter helps um, helps creating aggregates. Uh, and decreasing er and decreases erosion, uh, decreasing your tillage and having anything that covers your soil will will help with erosion. Um, okay, now I want to talk about the regulators. Uh, in this county, we have two um, two uh, um, agencies that regulate water quality. One is the regional board, so-called regional board. The real name is the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And there is a big board in, in Sacramento and they divided the state in nine or 10 regions and we're region nine. And each region has somewhat different um, rules. But um, if you are an ag business, you must be enrolled in the ag order. And I know that many of you are just because you are part of the irrigated land group. Uh, but anybody that has an ag business, anybody that wants to make money out of agriculture needs to be part of the ag order, even if, even if they don't make money, even if they make a minimum part of their income through agriculture, they still have to be uh, enrolled in the ag order. And again, the irrigated land group uh, can help you with your compliance. Uh, I want to repeat that you have to um, you have to uh, prepare this water quality protection plan. That is some kind of document, but it's not just a piece of paper that you have to sign. Some 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 it's not just a bureaucracy form. It's a document where you um, list all the practices that you will implement in your property to deal with water quality. And then the inspectors, when they come to your property, they will refer to that. So it's something that you can also, that you should also keep uh, um, updated. And if something changes, you should change it too. Uh, and then also uh, the regional board requires that you have quarterly self-inspections and you make an annual report. Um, and then the other regulator is the San Diego County uh, that with the watershed protection ordinance and they regulate everything that goes into the MS4. Now this MS4 uh, is not a street gang. Uh, it, means, it means the storm drain. Uh, it's a fancy way, it's a fancy way to call the storm drain. So when you see this MS4, they mean uh, what you can um, release from your property into the storm drain that is county, uh, that is the responsibility of the county. 
So with this slide, I tried to summarize uh, what the regulation require for you. And hopefully I wrote these catchy phrases that hopefully will stick uh, to your mind. And uh, because a lot of folks are, are confused out there. And again, there's a strong distinction between the irrigation water, that is the, the, the water that you pump uh, to your plants and then it runs off from there. And the storm water that inst instead is, the, is rain water. So the regulation for irrigation water are keep the water in your property, keep all the water in your property. I'm gonna say it again, all your irrigation water must remain in your property. So typically you will have to uh, build the pond where all this water is collected. And then from this pond, you can repump it uh, and some folks uh, reuse it to irrigate again. And there is some technologies to treat with to treat this water and I will talk about them in a minute. And uh, some folks just reuse it for things like uh, dust control, which is perfectly fine. So you can, you can uh, spray it, you can sprinkle it on your roads uh, to control dust, or you can just get rid of it by irrigating uh, your landscape or just by irrigating some area of your operation that are not uh, uh, cropped. But uh, uh, definitely with the prices of water in San Diego, when they told me how much you guys pay for one acre foot of water, I couldn't believe it. So uh, probably reusing that water, uh, even, if they, even, if, even if their recycling facility is expensive, it, it'll probably pencil out in a couple of years. Um, okay, storm water instead, can leave your property, starting from the first drop. Some, some folks told me, ah, no, Jerry, we have to, we have to capture the first uh, inch of rainwater. And some other folks said, ah, we have to catch the first uh, 10 hours. So there's, there's a lot of confusion out there. So I wanna make sure that everybody understands that storm water, yes, can leave your property, starting from the first drop, but it has to be still water <laughs> so the catchy the catchy the catchy sentence is only rain in the storm drain so again as i said earlier you are responsible your liability is in what this water what happens to this water between when it rains onto your property to when it leaves your property and i'm going to talk about uh, the practices that you can implement to uh, make sure that during this time, the water doesn't pick up sediment, doesn't pick up nitrate, doesn't pick up pesticides, doesn't pick up any other, any oils, fuels, anything that you can have in your property. If this water picks it up, it's a problem. And also uh, your storm water cannot be mixed with your irrigation runoff. So if you have a pond for your irrigation and it starts raining and the rain mixes up in the irrigation water, uh, with, in your pond and then the pond overflows, that's also a big no-no. So you will have to pump your irrigation pond dry uh, before the rains come. So if the rains then fill that pond and it overflows, it's still only rain. So now I have a question and I'm gonna give everybody one minute to read the question, how much runoff from irrigation water can leave my operation. And then I'm gonna ask for a volunteer to pick one, two, or three. Anybody wants to help us with this answer? Don't let me pick on you. Okay, I see folks giving the answer already on webcam. So the answer is number two, I must keep yeah, good job, good job. You got an A plus, Linda, you got an A plus. Uh, I must keep all my irrigation water in my property, right? No irrigation water can leave your property and you also cannot infiltrate it. So saying, okay, I'm gonna dig a big hole and put all the water there and it will infiltrate there and get rid of it that way. 
that's not an option. The pond must be lined. And we must be lined by, by pond lining, not like by a weed mat or something. It has to prevent the infiltration. Okay, another question. How much runoff from storm water can leave my operation? Do I have to catch the first inch? Do I have to keep all the storm water in my property? Who wants to answer? Let's see. Don't, don't, anybody wants to answer? Okay, I see a lot of trees and everybody's right. Everybody wins on this show. Uh, storm water can leave the property, but it cannot carry anything. It has to be, it has to be, okay. I saw, I saw also answers on chat. Thank you, Anselmo. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it has to be water. Okay, now this is a slide about management and I apologize, it's a BC. It's a busy slide, but somebody asked me, okay, Jerry, put, put everything in one slide. We want a, we want a fact sheet about, uh, about managing runoff. So this is my, my shot. This is my uh, Jerry's recipe on how to manage runoff. And I, and, I, and I divided it in these four categories. So the first one is avoiding, I avoid causing it. And uh, you know, sometimes I, I fight with my girlfriend, and uh, and then I ask myself, well, how do I manage this now? And uh, and the answer is always, well, I shouldn't have picked a fight in the first place. So uh, so uh, runoff uh, in agriculture is very much like a fight with your husband, or a fight with your with your wife. I know that many folks can relate. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to deal with it before it happens. So, anything that you can do to improve your irrigation, improve your distribution uniformity, your scheduling, fix your leak, uh, drip, uh, convert to drip, and a lot of folks out there, including myself, uh, can help you with many of these operations. Um, Vegetation, vegetation, vegetation. As I said earlier, if you plant vegetation in non-cultivated area, you provide an opportunity to this water to infiltrate and to be used by these plants. You can collect runoff from these impervious surfaces. I said earlier that your liability is between what happens between when the rain, when the rain hits your, your surfaces to when it leaves uh, in the storm drain. So you can build, uh, you can collect that water with gutters, with rain gutters and convey it into an underground pipeline and then connect it directly to, to the storm drain. Uh, you, can also, you can also connect all that rain water to a pond and then reuse it. And it would make a lot of sense with the prices of water in this county, but you can just get rid of it. And, uh, and NRCS has a practice called uh, called uh, roof uh, runoff structure that just that does just like that. And uh, again, ground cover, uh, providing some ground cover, pro uh, planting a cover crop, uh, infiltrates the water, uses the water, collects the sediment, collects the nutrients, uses these nutrients. So anything that you can do to vegetate surfaces with uh, filter strips, with hedgerows. Uh, these are all practices that are out there. And there is also help from programs like Healthy Soils or from, again, from an NRCS that can help you implement those practices that are about vegetating. Uh, OK, category number two, now we are uh, when we have tried to avoid causing this runoff, maybe we have mitigated some of it, but now we have this flow of water that is traveling inside our operation. So what can we do to avoid that it picks up sediment and it picks up pollutants while, while it's on its way from our property into the storm drain? What can we do? We can line our channels so, so the water will not cause erosion, so it will not pick up sediment. You can turn the, the, the channels into uh, underground pipelines, right? So you build the manhole 
and the water falls into the manhole and then it goes underground. So it doesn't pick up any, uh, any sediment. It doesn't cause erosion. You can, this is more for the, for the row crop guys, uh, but you can have a row arrangement where you have uh, less slope. So the water will not go, will not travel in the, in the um, steepest slope. And this is what my friend Ben is doing here in this picture with the, with the transect. You can provide some ground cover with, uh, with mulch, with gravel, with a weed mat. So again, this will uh, reduce the amount of uh, uh, sediment that the water picks up while, while flowing. Um, I'm told that this in, in this county, a lot of problem with erosions are caused by holes that are, dig, that are dug by gophers and squirrels. So um, minimizing, minimizing the damage caused by these animals also helps minimizing uh, your erosion issues. And then anything that has to do with housekeeping. I'm told that uh, the regional board inspectors, most of the problem, the most common problems that they find when they visit operation is related to housekeeping. So this is mostly common sense, but store your fertilizers indoor. Uh, uh, store your pesticides in some shelves. Make sure that things are neatly uh, stored and organized. Fuels, oils, make sure that all these uh, pollutants are kept uh, far away from the waterways. And also use secondary containment uh, for, uh, for fuels, for tanks that, that contain any of these fluids and, and, uh, and uh, clean your spills prepare some uh, spill kits, have them available and make sure that your people um, know that they have to uh, clean spills with the dry methods. Um, they don't have to take a hose and clean all the spilled uh, fertilizer. They have to sweep it. So a dry method is always uh, the way to go. Okay, so now we have tried to avoid that this water that flows in our operation picks up all these pollutants. Uh, what do we do now? Let's catch it in a pond so we can settle this sediment out. And so we have to build the sedimentation basin. And this is a very common practice for folks to deal with the runoff in their operation. So this slows down the water, the sedimentation pond slows the water, the velocity of the, of the water. And so it allows this sediment to um, settle out of solution. And you can also add polyacrylamide that is a um, chemical that we'll, I will talk about in a minute that, uh, that uh, helps uh, removing the sediment from the water before it loses before it leaves your operation. And then now that we have all this water in a pond and we have removed the sediment from it, what can we do? Well, we can reuse it for irrigation and there's a number of technologies like treating it with UV lights, uh, injecting ozone, injecting chlorine, injecting hydrogen peroxide. All these chemicals are things that uh, will kill the pathogens. Of course, for growers, the idea of reusing uh, runoff water is really scary because the, the, first, the first thought is, ah, I'm reusing, I'm, I'm recycling my Phytophthora, I'm recycling my Pitu, I'm recycling all my, my Fusarium, I'm recycling my pathogens in my irrigation water. So these are technologies that help you uh, disinfect that, that water before you reuse it. Then you can blend it with fresh water because typically this water tends to have high salinity. So typically folks blend it with fresh water again and you can use it to irrigate. Or uh, if you don't wanna apply this technology, you can, technologies you can just, as I said earlier, use it to irrigate landscape just to get rid of it, just to get rid of this water in your pond or for dust control. Uh, there is also technologies for denitrification. This is not something that probably a single grower would do in their 
property and I've, I don't know if it's uh, particularly used in this county, but there is technologies to get rid of nitrate. I know that uh, for water quality uh, in agriculture, nitrate is one of the big, uh, um, is one of the biggies uh, from the agency. So you can build these uh, wood chip bioreactors, basically is a pond, is a lined pond filled with wood chips. And what these wood chips do is that they provide a surface for anaerobic um, microorganisms to grow. And by doing so, these organisms use the nitrate. So it's a way, it's a cheap way to get rid of uh, the nitrate that is solved in this water. And maybe it's a treatment that maybe two or three operations can get together and say, okay, let's build this thing and uh, it will uh, get rid of nitrate from all the water that we all discharge into this creek or into this uh, uh, ditch. Another treatment that I wanna mention is activated carbon filters and these get rid of the soluble pesticides that are not removed by other, um, by other treatments. And typically you see these treatments one after the other. So you have a sedimentation pond that gets rid of the sediment. Then you have a wood chip bioreactor that gets rid of the, um, of the nitrate. And finally, uh, you have this uh, uh, carbon filter to get rid of the, of the soluble pesticides. Now I wanna, I wanna show you some pictures and talk about a little bit about each of these uh, points. So how do you improve your irrigation? Measure your distribution uniformity. Uh, the mission RCD, I'm gonna give you the um, contacts later. I hear that they provide assistance to measure the performance of your irrigation system. So you can put some buckets out there, you can put some cups, you can put some bottles, and this allow you to this allows you to measure the distribution uniformity and to improve it. Uh, you can convert to drip. You can train your people on how to use uh, moisture sensors. You can weigh your pots. Ask yourself the question: Is is do I need to irrigate for forty five minutes or thirty minutes is enough? And you can, you can ask yourself this question and find an answer even with very simple, very simple tools like weighing, weighing pots after 30 minutes and weighing pots after 30, after 45 and ask yourself, did the, did the water, did the weigh increase? Did I, did I put any more water in the last 15 minutes than I did in the first 30? Um, so make sure your people know how to measure pressure in your irrigation system and to adjust it install pressure regulators, uh, either at the blocks or at the, at the sprinkler head. Uh, use pressure compensating emitters if you're using drip irrigation. Fix your leaks. Make sure that your, that your irrigator, while they're irrigating, walks around looking for these geysers because you will always have some uh, coyotes or some other animals that uh, damage your, your lines. Uh, install a uh, water meter, a flow meter, and seek the assistance of folks that are knowledgeable about this, including myself. Uh, you can install a water meter and a data logger that will tell you how much water you have applied, and you can compare that to some recommendation, and you can do that in Spanish so your uh, field workers will, will understand and you can produce a table that will tell you when the pump went on, when the pump went off, how many gallons per minute went through and how long each irrigation lasted. And I promise they say, they say you cannot manage what you don't measure. And, and this is very true in this case. If you don't know, unless you know when and how much of that water is going, on, is, is going to your field, you will not be able to manage it. Make sure that flushing is easy. Uh, install install flushing valves. Make sure that the flush at, flushes at the end of the manifolds are easy accessible, like in these cases, and they're not and they're not just buried like we found in this job we did. 
Uh, and this is what we flush at the end of the lines when the irrigators don't flush regularly. And this causes plugging of the emitters and bad distribution uniformity and over irrigation. Uh, train your irrigators in, in, in Spanish so they understand the difference between drip lines. They understand what the pressure does to an irrigation system. They know how to manage nitrogen. They know how to size the um, uh, irrigation sets. Uh, you, can, you can convert from sprinkler to drip. Uh, this is uh, quite a popular uh, practice, uh, particularly in nurseries, and that many, many folks converted when the drought came, and uh, but some folks haven't haven't converted yet. So you can you can do that, and that will decrease substantially the amount of water that you have applied. So in for in this example, we did a job like that, and we basically we halved the water that was applied. But that also will, will decrease substantially the quantity of runoff that uh, this irrigation system will cause. And so that will be, will be a win-win, right? I save, I save water and I have something that, and I have a, it's a, a, a less thing that I have to deal with that gets me in trouble with the, with the regulators. But be aware that in some cases there's a trade-off with labor because now your workers are walking into this uh, filled with all this uh, tubing and it's going to take them longer uh, than they did before to pick up a pot. And if they're picking up 40,000 pots per acre, that, that, adds, that adds some time to, to, to what they're doing. Uh, don't, irrigating, don't irrigate non-cropped area, whether it's a road or whether it's an area where you had a crop before and you just removed the pots because uh, I have a, I have a, I have to deliver a shipment to Trader Joe's. Uh, uh, make sure you don't, you don't do what these folks is doing, what these folks are doing. They're irrigating an area that doesn't have a crop, and there is technologies out there that allow you to uh, avoid irrigating um, areas that you don't want to irrigate. There are sprinkler heads that where you can select. The arc, in this case, is 180 degrees, but you can you can pick 90, and you can you can pick the pattern, and this is good for for corners, or this is good for the edges of your field. Uh, line your ditches. Now now let's now we talk about the um, technologies to uh, avoid that your erosion picks up. Uh, sediment and pollutants in your operation. Line your ditch, your ditches. Um, plant some ground cover uh, in between in between the the rows. If you are a if you are growing trees, perennials, but also in your waterways, also in your in your channels. Um, catch the water from your roofs with a gutter and and connect it directly to a underground pipeline. Um, secondary containment. So you see that this fuel tank has a has a wall around it, and these folks that are mixing substrate for their pots, they're doing it on this uh, on this uh, concrete pad. And to clean up the spills, all the spills of fertilizer. Hopefully, it's uh, somebody goes there and sweeps it and uh, is not uh, picked up by some runoff. Uh, wash your equipment on a concrete pad that hopefully it's plumbed to the sewer and not on the lawn like this gentleman is doing here. Store your, your pesticides neatly in some uh, uh, shed with some shelves. Um, if you have old machinery, don't leave it out, outside, outdoor, because the rain can rain on it and pick up uh, fluids, uh, oils, uh, fuels. And I also know that if you have old machinery, that there is a program from NRCS for um, helping folks getting rid of their old tractor or of, of their old uh, diesel engine that are not very efficient. So you can contact uh, NRCS. I think it's called National Air Quality and I, no, Ash National Air Quality Improvement and uh, AQI, yeah, 
uh, uh, NRCS has this program. So if you have old um, old machinery, make sure that uh, it doesn't pollute the waterways. And again, secondary containment for your uh, pesticides and uh, fertilizers and fuels. Um, a sedimentation pond, again, is a very good idea. It has to be lined. Uh, it's not something that you can do just by renting a backhoe and digging a hole. Um, it's something that you probably want to seek some help to find an engineer that designs it for you. And also be aware um, that you need to get a, a grading permit from the county if you're moving more than 200 yard, than 200 uh, cubic yard of soil. And this is, it seems a lot, uh, but, it's, but it's not a lot of soil. Uh, so be aware that you do that you seek some help by folks that know how to do this, and uh, and you can have and you can have your your system with a manhole that catches your runoff from your irrigation water and is and is uh, plumbed connected to to your retention basin. Uh, be prepared for the rain event. Last uh, weekend we got I think half inch point. 0.6 inches of water. Uh, if you knew that that the, that rain event was coming, you probably wanted to 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 empty your irrigation runoff pond with a with a sump pump, like in this case. Uh, you probably want to make sure that so you want to make sure that your irrigation water doesn't get mixed with storm water. You want to clean up all the pollutants that you have in your yard because the rains are coming. Uh, one month ago, you probably may uh, have vegetated some bare areas by planting some grasses there. And you can also in install some temporary erosion control uh, structures like uh, uh, straw uh, waddles. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon, for um, pasting that link. That's the NAQI program for from NRCS. And also clean culverts, ditches and outlets. These structures typically, typically get uh, uh, filled with uh, sediments and they don't work anymore. And then some rains come and then and that's when we see big failures. So these structures require um, maintenance. So before the rains come, make sure that these structures are not obstructed. So I just moved to San Diego and I asked myself, okay, how many rains are we getting here? Uh, so far I lived in Santa Cruz. We used to get about 20 inches a year. Um, how, how much rains do we get here? So I connected to the CIMIS website. CIMIS is the California Irrigation Management System. It's run by DWR. And you can connect to any, they have a bunch of stations around the state, maybe 300 stations. You can connect to them, their, their weather station, and you can download the data. So I downloaded the rain data, and these are yearly rains. And you can see I downloaded for three stations, Escondido, Miramar, and Torrey Pines that are uh, on a gradient from the, uh, from the coastal condition to the more inland conditions. <laughs> And you see that on average, the rains are about probably 10 inches. So it's about half of what I used to get. But the funny thing is that if you look at daily rains, you will have um, few storms. So in this count, we don't get many storms, but within each storm, you get a lot of rain still. So the intensity, it's still high. And this is, these are the daily rains for 2020. And uh, maybe some of you folks remember these storms that we had in, in April. I wasn't here yet, but we got in, in three days, in four days, we got probably three or four inches of water. So, uh, and this is 2020, this is 2019, this is 2018. And so the point is that although we don't get a lot of rains in this county, the rains are very concentrated. And so 
it doesn't matter what year you're looking at, you always, these are the daily rain per year, 20 years of daily rains. Every year you may look at, you always get those three or four storms that you have to deal with that will have at least one, one and a half or even two inches of rain. So the rains are very concentrated. And so how much water do, I, do you get in a roof? So say that you have a greenhouses. These are three, five acres of greenhouses. This is just a fictional example. But you can go out there and, and measure your how many acres of your roofs you have. And one inch of rains will produce 27,000 gallons of water. So if you multiply the two, you will get you will get a very large quantity of water. And if it's two, if you get two inches of rains, this will be twice as much. And then based on this number, you can, you can think about how big your pond will have to be to catch all that water. And uh, of course you can build a, a gather and collect that water that rains on your, on your uh, roofs. Um, polyacrylamide I mentioned earlier is a, weird stuff it's a weird stuff is this chemical that comes in a powdered um, uh, form or it can also come in tablets and this stuff um, dilutes in the water very fast and it uh, it gets very very slippery it looks like snot and it uh, it dissolves in the water and what it does it glues together soil particles and so you see in this example, they put these two gathers full of soil and they have water flowing on them. And in this case, they have this tablet of, of PAM, of polyacrylamide, that water before, before flowing on the soil, uh, it falls on this and picks up this, uh, uh, this, uh, this PAM. And you can see that it causes a lot less runoff and, uh, and it infiltrates a lot more water. So some folks have these burlap bags and they put some of these tablets of this stuff that very slowly, very slowly um, dissolves in the water. And you can anchor these uh, burlap bags with a rope and have them there in your channel when you know that water will go through and will pick up this PAM. And this is the result. In these bottles, you see that this, this stuff, uh, it settles the, uh, the sediment out of solution. So now, now you will discharge this water, right? This clear, nice water into the storm drain instead of this uh, chocolate water on the right-hand side. And the regulators will be a lot happier. So again, it, it, uh, settles, it settles the soil particle out of solution. It also increases infiltration. So you will have less runoff. It will be clearer and you will have runoff. And uh, you can also apply to your uh, sediment pond. And, uh, but also since it settles the sediment out of solution, it also fills the pond faster. So make sure that you plan on, on, on maintain your sediment pond uh, often. And there is a lot of uh, information and you can click on this link. This is research by, the, by USDA. And in this area, I was able to found a company called Aquaben and here I put the contact of Sandra. You can contact her uh, if you want to buy uh, this, uh, um, uh, this polyacrylamide. Uh, other treatments of runoff water are injection of chlorine, ozone, of hydrogen peroxide. There is an expert at UC Riverside that works with these technologies. Uh, you can contact me uh, if you're interested and I can put you in contact with him. His name is Don Merhat. Uh, there is slow sand filters. These, all these uh, cylinders are filled with this sand. And, um, and this is a natural treatment, it's cheaper because uh, it only works by gravity. And, and, uh, and in this sense, it will develop a, a, a layer of microorganisms that also treat the water. And particularly, they get rid of the uh, plant um, pathogens. So this is another technology that is out there is available. 
Uh, this is what the wood chip bioreactor look like. Again, a pond full of wood chips. And uh, it, uh, again, it removes nitrates from the water. And you can easily buy these test strips. They're cheap. Uh, you can buy them uh, easily. And uh, it's at the minimum, they will allow you in just one minute to take a sample from the water that you're just discharging and ask yourself, am I over the regulation? Can I get in trouble for the amount of nitrate that I'm releasing uh, to the environment? And, and, and ask me, I can help you on how and where to buy this test strip. And, uh, and this is what a carbon filter looks like. Uh, I'm running out of time. So very quickly, I want to show you the result from a, from a runoff project that my colleague Oleg Dogovich up in uh, Ventura did. They're growing cane berries in hoop houses. And so in between these hoop houses, they get a lot of runoff. And they get a lot of erosion. And so they tried planting bar barley, mulching, uh, uh, applying this PAM, putting just a weed mat and just leaving it the way it is. And you can see from this picture, you get a lot of runoff from the untreated, you get less runoff from PAM, and the turbidity of the runoff is a lot less with vegetation, with PAM, and, and a little less just with the weed uh, mat. And they also studied how much all these uh, solutions, all this technology cost, and of course, just planting barley is the cheapest, but um, it requires management, right? You have to send your uh, people there to weed walk it or to get rid of it before it goes to seed, otherwise, otherwise it becomes a, a weed. Uh, resources, a lot of works was done by my predecessor. So if you go to our website, Cooperative Extension San Diego, Dot .ucanr .edu and you click on agriculture and then on ag water quality and then on grower research re grower resources you will get to this page and if you don't know where to start and if you are completely confused a good way to start are this self assessment it's just a document that will walk you through asking yourself a number of questions of things that you are doing or are, or you're not doing in your operation that affect water quality. So this is a big, this is a good uh, starting point for you, these self-assessment that are available on our website. And um, any of these uh, uh, practices that you may implement will have a cost, but NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service can help you, can help you with planning deciding what of these practices you want to apply with technical assistance for free. Like you get for free a super knowledgeable engineer that can help you plan your practices. And also you get a payment. I'm not allowed you to tell you that is a cost share. So I will not say that, but uh, you will get some payments. And these are a number of the practices that are allowed and you can call Raul and he can help you with implementing these practices. Also, I mentioned the Mission RCD can help you with the uh, irrigation system performance evaluation. Lance is the district manager. Uh, the irrigated land groups of the Farm Bureau, you probably are part of it. Uh, and if you're not, you probably should. And the San Diego County uh, water quality program. Uh, you have the website here. Um, thank you. This concludes your tour. If you need somebody to shovel mud from your sedimentation pond or for any other assistant, you can reach out to me and uh, please uh, give us some feedback. I think that we have a um, poll now. Um, I'm just asking you if this information is relevant to you, if you're going to use it. Uh, if it was boring, if it was helpful, if my accent is so terrible that you couldn't understand anything, any any criticism is uh, um, greatly appreciated. And now I realize we are running out of time. It's 4 p.m., but I'm going to open to uh, question. Anybody that has any question. Thank you, Linda. You're sweet. 
So the words is to you now. I am curious how, what's yeah. the cost of a pond? Uh, nothing so large, but when you talked about the fact it has to be dug, you need a permit, you need to line it, probably need some expertise. Any sense of what a range would be for something like that? Uh, in my experience, it's probably in the tens of thousands, if you want to do it right. But this, I'm very much not an expert in this, so I probably shouldn't have said numbers like this. But if you reach out to NRCS, yeah. those folks um, uh, are more knowledgeable than me about this. Um, the number that I just told you is based on uh, three or four growers that I worked with in Santa Cruz County that have built lined um, ponds and they, and what they spent was in that order of magnitude. Thank you. No problem. Any more questions? If you're shy, you can also write a, a question in the chat and I will read it for everybody. But, but don't be shy. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Yes, Tim. Any special concerns when you have a uh, natural creek bed through your property? I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, when you have a natural creek through your property, is there any special concerns there? If you have a natural creek, well, so all I know is that uh, there are a lot of regulations for riparian areas. And so you have to, basically you cannot touch any vegetation that is uh, any natural vegetation that is in uh, around your creek for any reason. And so the, all the riparian areas are highly regulated. And uh, one would think that you would wanna have some structures that uh, uh, treat uh, the water uh, before it uh, uh, reaches your creek. Uh, namely, you can have uh, filter strips uh, that is just a, a strip of, uh, of planted area with grasses that uh, uh, filter the water before it reaches the riparian area or, um, or uh, hedgerows uh, or, or similar. And these, these practices are also part of this uh, CDFA has a program called uh, um, Healthy Soils, Healthy Soils. So uh, you can, I think that every year they have a new round of um, applications and you can apply for financial assistance for implementing these practices. And, uh, and again, I think that NRCS will, will be a good, uh, um, a good resource for you to reach out uh, and, and ask them, I, I would like some, folk to visit, some folks to visit my property and to help me with the plan, uh, my conservation plan, because I'm concerned uh, with, my, with the runoff that may go into, my, into the natural creek that is in my property. Any more questions? No more questions. Well, thank you for your time on that, Jerry. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. All right. Um, and then I have everybody's name down for um, your lands group for one hour of your annual education. Um, if you want your additional hour to complete it for the year, we have one more webinar on um, next Wednesday. So. Ah, and it will be Christina from the regional board. So she will give you a lot of information that I was unable or un unwilling to give you about all the regulations. <laughs> 
about all the regulations that are that are out there specifically for the uh, for the regional board compliance. Yes. All right. Well, everybody have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.